Before we get started in Luke chapter 16, I want to set the context of what is taking place here. This is in the life of Jesus. It's the teaching ministry. And as we know, Jesus often taught in parables or what's called parabolic form. He taught in parables so that he could separate the people. Separate the people from those who were well just following him because he handed out free lunches. Those who would have to actually put forth some type of effort to gain an understanding would be sort of a winnowing, a separation, the, te- the weeds from, from the wheat or the sheep from the goats, if you would. And so here he is teaching Luke 15 in parables, and he's teaching to the multitude, which distinctly had three types, three groups. One was the crowd. They were the people in the middle. They were indifferent one way or the other. The free sandwiches came right on. That's why we're here. Then there was the crowd on the other side who were his followers that we call his disciples. They were there with the intent to learn, understand, follow, and obey. And on the opposite side of that, you had the religious leaders, the Pharisees, who were opposed to everything that he was teaching. So he was teaching to those groups, to the multitudes, and it was going just like usual. The crowds were waiting for something, the disciples were loving it, and the Pharisees were hating it. These parables he taught were the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the one perhaps we are most familiar with, the parable of the lost, or what we call the prodigal son. But here in chapter 16, verse 1, it says, He also said to his disciples, meaning that of those three distinct people groups in the crowd that day, he turns his attention now and focuses on his disciples. That being said, This is a family message, folks. This is for the church. Are you ready? Let's listen. Luke chapter 16, let's pick it up at verse 1. And he also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought against him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have resolved what I'll do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Verse 5. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, write 50. And he said to the other, and how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, my disciples, he's talking to, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, or literally it fails, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful with the unrighteous mammon, Who will commit to your trust true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's break apart this parable and explain the basics This is a very, very, very rich man who had established a corporate empire that was so big that he could not run it on his own. Things will get what's called bottlenecked. You know what that's called, right? It's a restriction. It means one person only has so much capacity to do so much. And if this rich man, this entrepreneur, is going to continue to climb the Fortune 500 list of that day, He's got to elect some executive staff to manage his affairs, and that's what this person was. Now, this manager who worked for him at an executive level overseeing his business was more than a little shady. In fact, 
His corrupt business practices were so bad that he brought attention to himself, and we see this periodically in the news in our day, that someone, everybody groaned at that, uh. Someone took note and reported back to the boss, to the CEO, to the owner, to the rich man. What was he doing that was so bad? The Bible says in verse 1 that he was wasting his goods. Now in the Greek, this word wasting means to scatter abroad. To throw grain up in the distance into the air that it may be separated from the chaff. We know this from the scripture. That when they farm, they would gather in the harvest and they would thresh it. Not thrash it but they would thrash it to thresh it. They would beat it up, throw it up in the air, and the chaff would separate from the wheat. The chaff, the things that would blow away, those little things that get stuck right here when you eat popcorn, you know, that stuff would blow away, and it's just the idea of this throwing it up, throwing it up, wasting. So that's the picture of what this guy was doing with his master's money, just throwing it around. Woohoo, woohoo, just having a good time. This is the same word that if you go back to that famous parable in Luke chapter 15, The prodigal son wasted his father's money with prodigal living, just throwing it out, waving your hands in the air like you just don't care. (laughs) So when the master, the rich man, finds out about this report, he gets called into the office. He gets called onto the carpet. What's up with all this stuff I'm hearing? What have you been doing you are going to come back in here and you're going to give an account for every penny. Now get out of my office. He didn't just fire him because that would have been bad. No, he wants him to come back into the office, have everything he's done put in front of him, get put on blast in all caps, humiliated, and then shown the door. For this guy, the gig's up, man. It's over. And I just want to say this. If there's secret things going on in your life as a Christian, God loves you too much to let that happen. One of the worst things that can happen to you is you never get caught. If you look back in your younger years with the things that you did, sometimes it's the best thing that ever happened to you that you got caught. So this manager leaves the office that day. He's frantic. He's freaking out. And he says, what am I going to do? I'm losing my job and I'm losing my place. What does it mean by his place? As his role on executive management, managing over this guy's corporation was by and large based on agriculture, meaning that he would have had a place to stay on the property. So not only does this guy not have a job, he's got nothing. He's lost his place. Zero, zip, zilch, nada. He knew himself in verse 3. What does he say? I can't dig. Listen, anybody can dig. You'll never get rich digging a ditch, but it's true, you can dig. So he's not saying I can't dig. He says I won't dig. I just can't bring myself to beg. I'm too embarrassed of what everybody thinks about me, but you weren't too embarrassed to worry about everybody else thought of you when you made Fox News and MSN that you were stealing from the Fortune 500 company. This guy, to be honest with you, I'm going to say this in church, this guy is what we call, he's a punk, okay? He's a total punk. He's a weasel and a waster through and through. So he figures out this plan because he knows he's going to be fired, but it hasn't happened yet. He still has that position. So what he does, he still has technically the authority to do. He brings back in the people who have done business with the master through him, and he asks what their astounding debt is on their account. The first one comes and says he owes a hundred measures of oil. This could have been up to a thousand gallons of oil, which would have been three years worth of pay. Think about that. The second one, a hundred measures of wheat, which would have been about a thousand bushels, which would have taken about eight years or growing seasons to produce. Listen, this is more than just you forgot your wallet at work and you asked your coworker for five bucks so you can go to a Taco Bell and get one of those boxes. Okay, this is a large amount of money and he brings them in and slashes one in half and slashes the other by 20. And notice he says, please hurry, hurry up and do it. Typical con man. Fine print, don't worry about it. Just sign it. It's going to work out great. This is the equivalent if you get the call from your mortgage company. Hello, Mr. Shane. This is a representative from J.P. Chase Bank. 
we're reviewing your account. At that point, your heart sinks. We're reviewing your account, and we notice that you owe $200,000. We have a new program, and we restructured your loan. And right when you're getting ready to complain, they say, you owe 100000 It's cut by 50%. And you go, wow, that's crazy. But notice, these people who got their bills slashed, did they ask any questions? It's like when you've been at the store, and I know you have because this has happened to me too. <laughs> and you're either buying something little or you're at Costco buying something big or you're at the department store and you're buying some clothes that are pretty fancy. And the clerk goes to ring them up and you're watching the little numbers and you go, that's not right. That was $89.99. They only charge me $19.99. What do you do? Do you do what I do? God, thanks for providing. You're awesome. I love your <laughs> gracious provision. Everybody who laughed. Everybody who laughed. Guilty. Uh, up until this point, it, it, it's a typical parable where there's symbolism that's going to be transferred to a meaning, just like the parable of the sower, right? The one who sows the seed, that's the word of God. The soil is this type of person who hears and does this. The weeds that come up are the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Everything means something in a parable except this parable. This is different. This is a contrastive parable where a principle is highlighted, focused on, emphasized, and then that same principle is translated for application into the children of God because he's talking to his disciples. This is a message for the church. So in essence, he says, I'm telling this story, all these characters, all these players, it brings about this one concept. Now we're leaving all the characters and players and the stories behind we're pivoting, we're turning, we're taking that concept, and I'm going to drop that right in your lap, and I'm going to build on it as an example. That's what's happening with this parable. Following the text, it pivots, and we're going to pivot by way of application after the explanation to this concept, which is about shrewdness, which is really wisdom in the context of money. I just said it, the M word in church. Money. Listen, I'm going to be real with you guys. I'm going to be frank with you. I know teaching about money and talking about money can be a real lightning rod of contention. It can be a point of division rather than something that unifies people. And people often do this. They throw out the baby with the bathwater. They take maybe something valuable along with the other things that are undesirable and <laughs> right out the road. Why do we do this? Because something has happened when you let the exception to the rule, well, this happened once, but that's wrong. This, here's the rule. Or you let an abuse of the truth. This is the truth, but this was an abuse. So I'm taking the whole thing because there was an exception and abuse, and I'm throwing out the truth with it. And you nullify and cancel it out. When it comes to discussing money, Christians are notoriously uneasy because at some point, every one of us has been manipulated for money, correct? Right? It's been a sore subject. It's caused division. We get squirmy in our seats when people start to talk about money. Listen, Pastor Chuck, who started, it should say, who God used to start Calvary Chapel, when it was really reaching its zenith in the Jesus People movement, they had all these crazy copycat ministries trying to get a piece of the pie financially. So he would get, true story, all these letters, and one of them was addressed to him, and it was real personal. It said, Dear Mr. Chapel, <laughs> I understand that God is blessing you mightis, might, mightily. I have a gift for you, true story. I have an anointed wallet that I have prayed for. And I am sending it to you that if you put your money in there and tithe back to my ministry, that will be increased and multiplied to you. Well, most of us would just take that and throw it away. Pastor Chuck sits down and writes back and says, I've got a better idea. Why don't you use your own magic wallet to get the money that you need? <laughs> there's a right way and there's a wrong way to teach about money. 
So I'm going to tell you this morning, take a breath, relax. This is not going to be a mission of manipulation, because guess what? We don't do that here at 412. Amen? I sat where you sat, and I heard my pastor say in 14 years he's been here, he's never preached a message on tithing. Why? He doesn't want to be known for that, and I think that's a good thing. But at the same time, we're due for a calibration, I believe, when it comes to these things. So as we pivot, I got two things for you this morning, two things from this passage we're going to look at as you take notes. Number one in verse 8 and 9, store up your treasures in heaven. Store up your treasures in heaven. The concept that is picked up and pivoted for application is the manager's shrewdness. Now, the shrewdness in and of itself is what is praised, not what he did. Do you understand that? The means don't justify the end. It's never right to do wrong in order to do right. In God's economy, the process is just as, if not more important than the product. In fact, God's got the product taken care of. He doesn't need us for it, but he involves us in the process along the way. This word shrewd in the Greek is the Greek word for nemos. It literally means intelligent and wise. It's prudent. It means you're mindful of your interests, and that is what is being commended here. This guy had created favor for himself. He was a sinful person who acted very cleverly, very ingenious, pulling out all the stops, whether they were good, bad, or ugly, all of his resources to secure his future and his well-being to make sure that the outcome was the best possible. And he was commended for having that foresight for thinking of his future. And people in the world, we have financial advisors and portfolios knowing how to plan aggressively and intentionally for what we inevitably know will come. I've seen this on flights I've been on businessmen who cannot pull themselves away from the business. They have their laptop out. They have their cell phone on. They're working all the way till the end. The stewardess says, turn it off. They don't turn it off until she finally says, look, you got to shut this off. They finally shut it off. As soon as the ding dong light comes on, they get back on that thing and they're closing deals. They're using every ounce of what they have to make sure the future is going to be okay. And Jesus says this, and it's shocking. They're doing more with their planning, their cunning, their intentional, unabashed passion for their pursuits, for that which is temporal, than the sons of light are doing for eternity. The same focus, the same thoughtfulness, the actions demonstrated, the zeal, the commitment, the determination, the effort. They seem to demonstrate it. This is a style of rabbinic teaching where you move from the lesser to the greater. In a sense, he's saying, these are sinners. These are sons. They're sons of the world. You're sons of light to the greater. They work, pull out all the stops for that which is going to end. You are living and working for something that never ends for eternity. Therefore, if they do that on the lesser, how much more should we be shrewd and wise for the greater? How do we do this? We store up our treasures in heaven. Store up your treasures in heaven. It says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. This has two things that we long for. This has longevity. It doesn't get destroyed. Moth or rust don't destroy it. Right, where's the magic pill? Where's the fountain of life that man is looking for for longevity? It's in eternity. Safety. Those who have money or have a lot of money, constant worry about where can I place it, that it's going to be secure. Where is it going to be safe? It says right here, if you store up your treasures in heaven, there's going to be longevity, there's going to be security, there's going to be the safety that you are really longing for. Notice what it says about the money in verse 9. It calls it unrighteous, and it says when you fail, literally that means when it fails or the wealth fails. Do you remember that guy in Luke chapter 8 who had so much money, so many goods, that he ran out of places to put it? His barns were full. The bank told him, we don't have any more room for your cash. Can you imagine that? He says, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down the bank, and I'll build a bigger one. That way I'll have all my dough in one spot, and I never have to worry about anything the rest of my life. And God says, you are a fool 
because you're going to die tonight. Wow. Someone said, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You heard that? (laughs) David Crowder, (laughs) we all like to listen to, says, well, now I can't say I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. And check it out, hashtag Simon the Times. Everybody's trying to take it with them. But if the stuff you have is your house or your car, you're not going to take it with you. In eternity, you're going to need your car? I hope not. How about a house? No, Jesus said he's building me one. I think it's going to be better. I think it's going to be better. The endless personal accumulation is meaningless. Wherever your treasure is, it's going to stay. But here's the good news about this. You can use it in a transformative fashion. This is crazy. To impact eternity. You can use that which will ultimately end. It's going to fail to impact that which will never end. It cannot fail. Wouldn't this be the highest and greatest return? If you look at your money, where can I place it? That it's going to reach the most return? Wouldn't it be to pay it forward on into eternity where it's something that is going to be transformed into that which is eternal? We have the opportunity, it says, to buy friends with unrighteous money who will receive you at the end to the eternal dwelling by friends for heaven like souls who are going to be there at the gate ready to meet you. This is crazy. You can support a missionary in a third world country and I'm not here going to pass a plate or have a table with little things for you to pick up at the end. I'm just using this as an illustration. You can support a missionary in a third world country for 30 bucks a month. That's about a buck a day. If I do the math right, it's $360 a year. Can you live on that? I can try living on $360 a week with two kids. It ain't going to happen. But I can pay that forward for a small amount to a third world country where a guy can live full time and preach the gospel. And when you get to heaven and you see all that, you have no idea what's going on. Your mind just gets blown with what God did with that money. It's crazy. It's crazy. Invest in kingdom enterprises that bring about the salvation of sinners. Invest in the gospel. Invest in the spiritual. Invest in the eternal. And I want to say this. Our church here, we're blessed. We have a great fellowship here. There's a lot of believers, and we have an awesome opportunity to be a part of something here in little old San Jacinto, California. This is where I grew up. So store your treasures in heaven. It will keep your heart in the right place. Because if you keep reading the same verse, you read the first part, look at what it says in 21 right there. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's an inseparable link between your treasure and your heart. And when I was first a new believer, I tried to break it. I said, God, you're my treasure, but I love my money. And God said, no, you love your money, but not me. You can't serve two masters. So take your treasure and put it where it's supposed to be, then your heart is going to be maintained in the right spot where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. Number two this morning, if you're taking notes. Number one, we saw store up treasures in heaven. Number two, pay the tithe. He talks about being faithful in the little things. D.L. Moody said, I can tell more about the spirituality of man by reading through his checkbook than I can by reading through his prayer book. (laughs) The Bible talks about the tithe, and it literally means one-tenth or ten percent. That's what a tithe means. It means ten percent, one-tenth. I know there's a lot of people that have come to church and a lot of people that have gotten saved, and I wrestled with this when I was young in the faith, so this may be for you. This is a classic passage that is pulled up when people preach on money. It's Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. It's often used, and listen to me, it's most misused and abused. Let's read it. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, in what way have I robbed you? And the tithes and the offerings, you're cursed with a curse. For you robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And now try me in this. Test me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. And you've all heard this where they say, you're ripping off God, man. That's why you're cursed. You need to, and man, you just feel this guilt trip on you to give. And you're like, 
I'm going to give just to get this guy out of here. Right? Let's, let's, let's move this guy on. That's money well spent. That's not what this is talking about is we're going to develop this further into the New Testament. But just a couple things here is that the tithe does belong to God. That's what the Bible teaches. You can't get around it. There's a Christian comedian that somebody turned me on to. His name is Michael Jr. He uses those, those sensitive topics couched in humor within the church to bring people together. He talks a lot about racism. That which divides people, he uses it in the context of humor with his God-given abilities to bring people together. He talks about money and he talks about this passage and he said, tithing isn't giving, tithing is just not stealing. I was like, whoa, that's too convicting. I need to find another Christian comedian to listen to. (laughs) But maybe you're here and you've heard this and you say, well, time out, time out. I know my Bible, Jim. And this is the law. This is the Old Testament. Does this apply to us? In the church, in the New Testament. Well, let's go back a little further and look at a man named Jacob. Jacob was running, and he spent the night. It says he pulled up a rock for his pillow, and he had this wild dream. No doubt, if you use a rock for a pillow, you're probably going to dream some crazy things. I'm just saying. But it's where he has that famous dream where the ladder goes up to heaven and down to earth, and then the angel of God are descending and ascending. Jesus would reference it later in his teaching ministry as if he is going to be that bridge from that which is sinful to that which is holy, from that which will perish to that which we can live forever. He is going to be the way, the truth, and the life. And Jacob wakes up from his sleep and he says, wow, surely the Lord's in this place. I didn't even know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And the stone which I have set as a pillar, it was a pillow, he tried to spiritualize it. Jacob was kind of a waster himself, if you read his story. Shall be the house of God, and notice this, and all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Moses hadn't even shown up yet. Law is not even written. And Jacob is tithing when he realizes, wow, God's working in his life. And I love how he says, I didn't even know it. So true. Let's go back a little further to the first mention of tithing. We talked about Abraham. Let's go to Genesis 14. Abraham, everybody's got a lot in their family, right? A knucklehead. When the phone rings, it's like you're in trouble or you want money. That's usually what it is. So Lot calls and said, man, we've been taking Captain Abraham. Can you help me out? So Abraham goes, oy vey. Mounts up his servants, goes and has a mighty victory over 10 kings. When he returns, this mysterious figure shows up named Melchizedek. He's the king of Salem, which means the king of peace. It says that he doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. Some theologians believe that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Because we know Jesus didn't come into existence on Christmas. He became a man at Christmas. But before that, in eternity, he existed as the second person of the Trinity in the Godhead. And some believe this is a pre-Christmas, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. He is the king of peace. He brings out bread and wine. How symbolic of the new covenant. He was the priest of the Most High God. He blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham, God of Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And what does it say? And he, Abram, gave him a tithe of all. Now wrap your brain around this for a minute. Here you have a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ who is receiving a tithe before the law was even given. This is wild, and it keeps getting better. As you look into the New Testament, and let's see what Jesus said when he was on earth. In Luke chapter 11, verse 42, he says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe the mint and the rue and all manners of herbs. You got your little scissors and your little scales and your toothpicks, and you're trying to pick out just enough for 10% because it better not be 9.99999 or 10.11111. It better be 10 because we've got to be exact to the law. And what he tells them is a rebuke. He says, you just pass by, you blow by justice and the love of God. These you should have done. 
You're tithing and you're so meticulous, but you're missing the part of justice and God's love. But as you continue to read, you've got to catch this saint. He doesn't say, then don't worry about the other. Look what he says. He says, without leaving the others undone. You should tithe, that's good. But you forgot justice and love. And when you do justice and love, guess what? Don't leave the tithe undone either. Jesus sanctions tithing in the New Testament. So the Bible teaches that the tithe is very much alive and well, and it's clear that the tithe belongs to God. So how does this work? How does this work? 1 Corinthians 6, 2 says, On the first day of the week, let each of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper proportionally, that there will be no collections when I come. What is he saying on the first day of the week? What day is that? That's Sunday. When you meet. That's church. This is New Testament stuff. As you prosper, as God gives the increase proportionally to you, will be different proportionally to you, will be different proportionally to me. But lay it aside. Take it off. Put it aside so that when you come together, it is ready to go. The Bible teaches this principle of first fruits. In Proverbs 3 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Teaches that the first should go to God. Now, there's a story of a guy back in an agrarian society, and his cow had twins. That was like hitting the jackpot. That was the daily double for sure. Twice as rich. And he is so excited, so exuberant, right there on the spot. He says, Lord, I'm going to offer you one of these cows. It's yours. 50%. Giving it. Comes out the next day and one of the cows died. The cow's is dead. Bows his head and says, Lord, I'm sorry your cow died. (laughs) Glad you're laughing. This is good. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. It's a grace thing, you guys. Not grudgingly. If you're here for the first time and you're not saved, don't give anything. You think God needs your money? The Bible says, God says, I'm in heaven. It's my throne. Earth is my footstool, it says in the Psalms. If I needed anything, do you think I'd ask you? I don't think so. And it says God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful in the Greek, it's where we get our English word hilarious. That's a strong word, right? Because you can listen to even a comedian, a Christian comedian, and you can say, that guy's funny. And you say, well, I got one better than you. That guy's hilarious, right? (laughs) God loves that type of giving where there is so much joy because you understand it. You're not grudgingly. You're not being manipulated. You're not trying to get the guilt monkey off your back to make the angry man passing the plate go away. (laughs) You're worshiping the Lord because you understand the principles laid out in Scripture. Now, how many are actually from the valley? You're here. Just admit it. I'm from here too. (laughs) Born in him at hospital. Around circa 1994, do you guys remember where the Farmer's Fair used to be on the corner of Palm and Florida? They built a grocery store there called Smith's, Smith's, then Lucky's, right? Then Albertson's, and now Walmart Neighborhood Market's running the show over there. Well, I worked for all three of those grocery stores. I remember getting a job circa 1994, fresh believer, thought I knew what I was doing, And I was making 18 bucks an hour. Now, from a poor kid in 1994 who grew up in the in the in the in the barrio of San Jacinto, dude, I was living large, man. Eighteen dollar one hour is a good deal for Jim Shane. And I was that guy who would go to the ATM, put my card in, yes, to get the 20. I put the 20 in my pocket, but more importantly, the 20 was that little receipt. That little receipt told me how much I still had in there. I had no idea. I didn't track it, had no spending plan, nothing. So I would go with anxiety. One time I put it in and it didn't give my card back. I was like, man, I guess I used it too many times. I had no idea. 
Then I met this cute little blonde who would later become my wife. Her name was Allison Olson. Fast forward, Allison Shane. 17 years this August. She's put up with me. And she had, yeah, she deserves that. She deserves that. She had this thing called a budget. (laughs) She had a paper with numbers on it and categories and stuff. I'm like, what is that, right? She had a savings account, and she worked at a trophy shop (laughs) making minimum wage. Like, what was that, five bucks an hour back then or something? She's making less, they're making three times more, more than her, and she's got a savings account, and she showed me how much was in her savings account. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, this is probably the one right here. (laughs) It's probably the one. This is a sign from God. And at her budget, she had this thing on the top called the tithe. I was like, what? You give money to the church? What do you do that for? (laughs) Then I found out this. Tithing is not God's way of getting your money. Tithing is a tool God uses to bless you, to mature you, to grow you so he can bless you so you can in turn be a blessing. And you got to understand this. God does not need your money, but God does want your heart. And he knows where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. Tithing keeps your heart in the right place because it keeps your treasure in the right place and it safeguards you from falling into the pursuit of money, which it says in 1 Timothy that many Christians have sought after money and it says they pierce themselves through the instance of a spear going through with many, many pains and they've suffered loss when you chase money. Proverbs says, do you see th- Do you seek wealth? Cease your consideration of it because it makes wings like an eagle and it just flies away. My dad used to say, easy come, easy go, son. Easy come, easy go. So in verse 13, where it says you can't serve two masters, and I I told you before that I used to try to do that. I didn't like this verse because it convicted me. I wish I could just, these pages would maybe stick together and I could just move on and find something better. But when you see this, not as something to say, oh, man, I can't serve two masters. Try to look at verse 13 where it says you can't serve two masters as a promise. You can't serve two masters. You won't be able to serve two masters. It's impossible. Sweet like this. If I'm serving God by giving of my finances, then I can't serve the material possessions. I won't fall to it. I don't have to worry about loving money and hating God or being loyal to money and despising God. This is a great safeguard. How can I sign up for the spiritual heart protection plan? In this message, we looked previously at Genesis chapter 14. And Abram had a mighty victory when he went and he kicked those ten king's cans. What happened in the day was they took all their stuff. So Abram comes back just loaded. The guy's got massive, massive amounts of money. And he gives a tenth to Melchizedek right on the heels of paying a tithe to the prince of peace. You know who shows up? The prince of perversion, the king of Sodom himself. Abram, thanks a lot. Just give me my people back, and you can go ahead and keep all the stuff. You know what Abram literally tells him? You go pound sand you prince of perversion, because I'm not going to take one shoelace from you lest anybody say, I am who I am because of you and not because of my God. Wow, here's the thing. What did he just do? He gave a tenth to the prince of peace. I think this is a picture of an Old Testament reality that is working itself out into the New Testament application of his heart didn't bat a beat at getting all those goods because He honored the Lord with the first fruits of his produce. That's a great, great, great picture. Because here's the thing. It's not saying that those who tithe are never going to suffer loss. Where it says given, it'll be given back to you. It might be money, it might not. Okay, tithing isn't like spiritual lottery, you know, or spiritual gambling. That's not what it is. You're worshiping the Lord, and he will give you back. He promises to provide your needs so you can provide for your family, but the stuff that he gives will be greater. It'll be stuff at times that money 
can't buy. And the difference that it makes is that it will make a difference in the place where it counts most, and that will be in your heart. So when you give, guess what? You have an opportunity. Give away some of your carnality. When you give, it's a safeguard. You give away some of your greed. It's all about grace, and you just have to start somewhere. When I was so messed up financially, I didn't say, okay, I'm giving 10%. It was like, all right, I had to learn my way through. Let's try with this. Let's try with this. Now let's do this. Now let's try this. And I saw, wow, this is awesome. You know why? Because God doesn't need this, but he wants my heart. And this is such a blessing. Just like everything else, when I got saved and I started to realize they're more than just going to heaven, God's given us principles for living and they're found in his word. When I got married, guess what, men? When the Bible says, love your wife, says Christ love your church, even though you don't feel like it and she might not deserve it, if you do it, it works. And you don't deserve it either, by the way, when she gives it back. When your kids frustrate you and the Bible says, don't exasperate your children towards anger, but have patience, be calm, train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it works. When God says, pray for those who persecute you, pray for those who despitefully use you, and at work you do that and you pray, it works and you have joy and you overcome. In the same way where God says, give to the finances, why would we separate that out as a different category from any other blessing he wants to offer us through obedience? That's biblical giving, folks. It's biblical giving. So maybe you do have struggles. Maybe you're like me. You're kind of throwing that baby out with the bath water. Have you guys heard of Dave Ramsey? Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University. If you're struggling and you need more like worksheets or nuts and bolts, his stuff's very good. It's a great place to start. I want to offer that resource to you. In closing, I want to talk about a guy that I read about when I first got saved and just captivated me. The book was called Through Gates of Splendor. It was the story of a man named Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a young guy. He was a stud. He won the state wrestling champion. Back then it was wrestling. wrestling. And he wrote things like, Mom, you're going to hear that I won the state championship in wrestling. What it means is I have a more fit body to serve my Lord. Wow. He gave his life to go to Ecuador to try to reach these Aka Indians and attempt to evangelize them to eternity. And they were making grounds. They were flying over, dropping gifts, lowering a basket, picking it up, till they finally touched down on the beach and they all came out, snuck up on them, and speared him to death. The last thing Jim Elliott saw was the people that he had given his life to trying to kill him and his friends, and they did. Fast forward to heaven. His wife picked up the work and carried on. And the Alcas heard the gospel, and they got saved. Make friends that when you get to heaven, they'll receive you. And you can you imagine what's happening there? He said this, and I want to leave you with this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose.